Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by... Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. And by Single Player Mode, a personalized gaming experience. The newest book from Truist Dunkworth, intended for middle and high schoolers. It is a book as intriguing as it is mysterious. Now available on Amazon. You're listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. I'm Dom Bethanelli, and I'm joined today by Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, this is an episode that we recorded to thank our patrons at patreon.com slash StarQuest for their generosity in making this and all our shows at StarQuest possible. We gave them early exclusive access, but now we're sharing it with you to show you one of the benefits of being a patron. So please enjoy this show. All right, let's begin with, uh, I'm going to take advantage of my position (laughs) as -hmm. as co-host of the show, and uh, I'm going to ask my own question. I have questions that I want to ask Jimmy, and I thought others might be interested. So this is my question. Is it possible, is there is a possible reason that human beings have an instinctive reaction against the near-human simulacra, the, the uncanny valley phenomenon? Because when we first evolved, there were nine near hominid species, such as Neanderthals, that we were competing with and killed off in a mass extinction? I don't know that we know the exact number of subspecies that our ancestors lived alongside of. We know there were several, and we know that because not only have we found their bones in many cases, but we've also got some of their DNA in ours. And I can't rule out that part of the Uncanny Valley phenomena, like where you see a mannequin or a zombie, and it looks almost human, but it's creepy, that I don't know that that this doesn't play a role in the Uncanny Valley phenomenon, but I suspect e- even if it does, there are other stronger things that are playing a role there. One of them is healthy human beings have, like any life form, have a certain look to them. For example, facial symmetry of certain types or body symmetry of certain types. And if someone varies from that, it can be a sign of disease. You know, this is one reason that the the disease could be caused by organisms, you know, parasites and things like that. This is one reason zombies that look like kind of they're deteriorating That's one reason they're creepy. It's not safe for us to be around dead human bodies that are deteriorating. Those signs of death and decomposition need to repel us so we stay away from the source of infection. That's also why we bury the dead or cremate them or things like that. So part of looking human but not quite can be due to disease and the organisms that cause it. Also, it can be due to genetic factors. And so if someone or something looks almost human but not quite, it could be a sign that they have a genetic condition that's bad. And that could be a sign that if we mated with them, that our offspring would be bad. And this isn't something we're conscious of at least haven't been until the modern age, but still on an instinctual level, our evolution is looking out for us and wanting us to not have damaged offspring. And so there's, you know, now should that happen, we need to accept it with grace and we need to care for the offspring just like other human beings because they are. But on an instinctual level, our instincts are meant to guide us to have healthy offspring. And so if we encounter someone that looks like they've got a weird genetic condition, that's not, we're not going to find that as attractive as someone who meets this stereotypical full human 
everything's looking healthy and symmetrical paradigm. So applying that to other hominid subspecies, we did breed with them. So that means that we couldn't have found them too repulsive. And that would suggest, now, maybe there was some of that, but it obviously wasn't enough to stop us from interbreeding with them. Also, I like on Instapundit, Glenn Reynolds, whenever he runs stories about this, talks about how unbearably sexy our Homo sapiens ancestors were, that all the other subspecies wanted to mate with them. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also something known as hybrid vigor. Hybrid vigor occurs when you have two genetically dissimilar members of the same species that breed and the offspring, because of that genetic diversity, gains something by it. Hmm. And so there actually can be an attraction to people that are genetically dissimilar to you. And this is one of the things that drives the practice of marrying outside your tribe, otherwise known as exogamy. You see someone and it's like, wow, that person is exotic looking hmm. and they're attractive. I mean, I've, you know, I've experienced this. My ancestors come from European background, but, and I find European background women attractive, but sometimes you see someone from another background and it's like, wow, that person is sexy and exotic looking. And, and that also helps improve the genetic diversity of a community so that it doesn't become inbred. So you want a balance between endogamy or marrying within the group and exogamy or marrying outside the group so that it has periodic refreshes of hybrid vigor and doesn't become genetically homogenized such that one virus comes along and can wipe out the whole group. Right. So I think there's a balance of factors here. Interesting. Well, thank you. That was that was good. I, I'm I'm glad I asked you the question. So let's go on to some patrons' questions. Robert C writes: Have you done an episode on terminal lucidity yet? I've joined the party late, so I've not listened to a lot of the older episodes. If you're not familiar with it, terminal lucidity is an observed increase in lucidity of patients near death. For example, in Alzheimer's disease patients who has lost most long-term memory and conversational ability who suddenly recognizes family and friends and can carry on coherent conversations, only to pass away a short time later. From what I've read on the internet, for what it's worth, it seems to be fairly common to the point where some hospice settings recommend advising family members of the possibility of it happening. Seems like a topic that fits well into your faith and reason framework. We're definitely going to have future episodes on deathbed phenomena. We already have had one on near-death experiences where someone clinically dies and then comes back. But we're going to be talking about other deathbed phenomena in the future, including terminal lucidity. In terms of how it works, so this is the big debate. It's only recently been classified and named in medical literature, really only back in 2009 was when the first paper on terminal lucidity was published, and we'll have a link to that paper. It, subsequent to being named, has become the object of some studies, but the data is all still pretty preliminary. At present, it looks like of people who have serious cognitive decline, whether it's due to Alzheimer's or something else, about 10% have an episode of terminal lucidity where shortly before death, they their mental function improves dramatically. And it typically doesn't last for very long uh, because 42% of them die within 24 hours of that happening and 84% of them die within a week of that happening. And the lucidity itself may not last all of that time. They may be like back and in charge for five minutes or, or an hour or something, and then it, it goes away. The big question is what explains this? Now, from a Christian perspective, from the faith perspective, it's obviously a divine gift to the people around the person to be able to say goodbye to their loved one. It's also a gift to the loved one to maybe... When they went into a demented state, they weren't in a state of grace, and now they have the chance to fix that. So it can be a kind of last-minute evangelization. So it's definitely a divine gift. The question is, does God intervene miraculously to do it, or is there a natural explanation for this based in human nature? And 
if it's based in human nature, it could happen either on the spiritual level or on the physical level, because we have both a spirit and a body, or it could be both. One proposal for how it could work is that it's a, it, it happens in the body, and it's essentially a rally, that your, your body has realized things are seriously wrong, and we need to do our utmost to try and restore normal function, or we're going to die. And in fact, the person is going to die. Things are that far badly gone, but your body has some kind of reflex to try to put things back together. It's like if things get to a certain point of badness, the reflex triggers, and it's like, we've really got to take action. Let's try to get us back to normal functioning. And it does that temporarily, but it doesn't have the ability to do so permanently. And so death swiftly follows. Another possibility, and this one is a little more on the spiritual level, is that because the spirit is having its connection to the body interrupted, because the spirit is what makes the body alive and it's about to die, so there's something happening in that relationship between body and spirit, that it kind of, as as that relationship is changing between body and spirit, something shakes loose that allows mental function to improve. So it could be, and one way of looking at it that kind of merges the two perspectives is maybe the cognitive decline is caused by physical considerations that are now breaking down. So it's kind of like, think about how a person has normal mental function, which involves a spiritual element, but then they get drunk or high. And the introduction of those chemicals into the body then impairs otherwise ordinary mental function. So it's a physiological change that results in impaired mental function. So maybe over time with Alzheimer's and other conditions that lead to impaired mental function, maybe as those are breaking down in preparation for death, those constraints that are physical on mental function start breaking down as death approaches, allowing regular mental function to flourish now that the structures that were impeding it are going away or are going offline. Okay. Okay. Very good. But all that's, all that's speculation at this point. We don't have the research right. to know. All right. Uh, Nicholas Delgado Braun asks the next question, says, uh, first, a shorter question. Given that light is often used metaphorically or symbolically as emanating from God or his action in the world, and given that modern physics describes light as not experiencing time because it is massless and thus moves at C, the constant C, could there be some deeper connection between the light of God and physical light since neither God nor photons move through time? So this is an interesting question. Actually, and this is a little mind-blowing when you first hear it, so I may have to talk about it more in the future, everything moves through space-time at the speed of light. All of us are doing that. Massless things have all of that motion through space-time in the spatial dimensions. But we, being massive, have part of that shifted into time, and it's not purely motion through space. So there's a very interesting relationship here, but actually the way it's commonly conceived in physics, every particle is moving through space-time at the speed of light. It's just a question of how much of that manifests as moving through space and how much of it manifests as moving through time. In the case of light, from its own perspective, does not experience motion through time, but it does experience motion through space from an external perspective. And that means it's not a, it's not a perfect analogy for God because God is completely outside of space and time. He's not extended through space time the way a a beam of light is. And so you can analogize anything to God because you can analogize God is manifested in one way or another through all of his creatures including light. But there's always a limit because no creature is ever identical to God. So there's always a metaphor you can make, but it's always a limited metaphor. In the case of light, I suspect the real reason that we associate light with God is sort of three or fourfold. One, we are diurnal animals. 
we are awake in the daytime. That's when we function well. We have really poor night vision compared to other animals. And so light is something we need as human beings in order to function well. That's why we don't like it when it's dark. We stumble around when it's dark. We can injure ourselves when it's dark. But we operate really well in the daytime. Also, we are heavily vision-oriented animals, and vision depends on light. We're not like dogs that are more about smell than they are about vision. Our sense of smell is very poor. But if we were different, if we were different kinds of creatures, if God had made us so that we are nocturnal, then darkness would be our preferred environment. And we might think about God in terms of the comforting darkness that allows us to to operate in the world and receive the blessings of his creation instead of that unbearably awful bright part of the day that we would then associate with the forces that attack us and make it hard for us to flourish as God's creatures. Similarly, if we were like dogs and were more smell-based than vision-based. We might think of God primarily not in terms of light, but in terms of the best smell imaginable, probably bacon. <laughs> yes. God so is our bacon. <laughs> I, yeah. So I, so I think that the fact we associate God with light is more due to the kinds of creatures that he made us and what we respond to and what we find flourishing. May the bacon of God be upon you. Uh, so that's what yeah. we yeah. <laughs> well, if you think about it, I was just thinking about that. Light, I mean, the sunlight, it, the sun is a dangerous thing just in our normal life. It's dangerous to look at it, you know? Well, it is. And so, yeah. so you know, if you, if you have too much light, it can be blinding. And actually, that helps the metaphor with God because it's like he's the source. He's the most intense light. Right. And we can't look at him or experience him directly or it's dangerous. But like looking at the sun, but still we need light. And so we think of light as a good thing Mm. rather than if, if you were, if we were, you know, bats, we might think of light as fundamentally oppressive instead of (laughs) fundamentally good. Right. Right. That bears some thinking about that's, that's some good thinking. Oh yeah. And Nicholas has a second question. Uh, He'd say a a larger, longer question I think would deserve a full episode. The mystery of free will. Faith tells us that God gave us the gift of free will, but why? And how does this interact with divine omniscience? Not only this, but some modern scientific theories claim that the physical universe could be completely deterministic or that all of time exists and we are simply moving through a predetermined sequence of events. So you're right. It would require a full episode to discuss free will, but I have added it to the big list of topics that I keep in a spreadsheet. (laughs) Excellent. All right. Andrew Tchaikovsky uh, says, hi, Jimmy and Dom. Became a patron a couple months ago. Been listening to two to three episodes a day in an effort to catch up. All fascinating. Yay. That's all, that's dedication. I'm from the Midwest and would love your thoughts on the Owl Man slash Mothman at O'Hare International Airport in Chicago. Multiple sightings have been reported over the last few years. Thanks and keep up the great work. So we'll have links to some recent accounts of the O'Hare Owlman, Mothman. The original Mothman was reported back in the 1960s, late 1960s, mid to late 1960s in West Virginia. And lately there has been a report of something similar at O'Hare Airport in, in that surrounding area that you know, has also been called Mothman or Owlman. Basically, when you listen to the eyewitness descriptions of it, it sounds like a bird. It sounds like a big, tall bird with red eyes and an enormous wingspan. Now, the speculation, and we will be talking about the original Mothman in the future. I've got already got John Keel's famous book, The Mothman Prophecies, and we will talk about it in the future. A proposed naturalistic explanation for the original Mothman was the Sandhill Crane. Sandhill Cranes are very tall. They have an up to eight-foot wingspan. So when they spread out their wings, you know, they're really big. And they also have red plumage on their head around their eyes. And so if you see a sandhill crane standing really tall and in the dark and spreading its wings, that's a possible explanation for what the original Mothman was. And that's also a possible explanation for the Chicago O'Hare Mothman, because uh, they, in fact, 
if I recall correctly, sandhill cranes do live in and around the Great Lakes region. So we'll have more information about all of that. Awesome. Mike M. asks, what does Jimmy think happened to D.B. Cooper? So D.B. Cooper was a airplane hijacker who got money and then used a parachute to jump out of a plane over the Pacific Northwest at, at night in cold and like raining, sleeting, I believe, and things like that over a forest. And the FBI, after investigating D.B. Cooper, con concluded that he, he pro most probably died. I don't think so. D.B. Cooper's jump, which we will be talking about, the plan is to talk about it this November when it'll be the 50th anniversary of his jump. But the FBI portrayed this as an exceedingly dangerous jump that nobody would survive, even if you were an expert and things like that. So he probably died in the jump. Nonsense. You can go on skydiving services today and repeat D.B. Cooper's jump. It is a regularly offered service in the skydiving community in the Pacific Northwest. So it is not as dangerous as was proposed. And I, I can't prove it, but my suspicion is that D.B. Cooper survived. Interesting. Well, I'm, I am totally looking forward to that episode in November if we get to that, because that's, it's one of the classic mysteries. Yeah. If we get to that this year, yes. we will get to it in the future. Yes, yes. Anonymous says, uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask questions. This is a bit of a mass class type question, uh, I think liturgical, but I think it's mysterious. The general instruction of the Roman Missal says in number 220, it is appropriate that the commemoration memento of the living and the communicantes in communion with those be assigned to one or other of the concelebrating priests who then pronounces these prayers alone with hands extended and in a loud voice, end quote. We often have a concelebrant at Mass, so I went looking for a reason why, why this particular part of the Eucharistic prayer is for the concelebrant to proclaim. Is there any other reason for this particular part of our prayer to be said by the concelebrant other than it is appropriate? Thank you for all you do. I hope you're having a great new year and that you and your families are staying safe. And don't forget, ite ad Yosef. So the basic reason now concelebration is a longstanding concelebration for people who may not be aware is where you have more than one priest sit consecrating the Eucharist at mass. And this is a common practice going back a long time in Eastern churches and following the second Vatican council, it became an option in the Western church as well. And so Basically, when they looked at the prayers of the Liturgy of the Eucharist, they said, okay, well, if we have concelebration going on, we want all of the concelebrating priests to say the words of institution. You know, this is my body, this is my blood. They all say that in union. But we want to have them all participate more than just that. And it would be prohibitively difficult to have them all say everything in unison. You know, it's hard enough to get people to say a prayer in unison without lags and delays since they're going to go at slightly different speeds, as was particularly emphasized to us in 2020 as people were trying to say prayers over Zoom. <laughs> but so it would be really hard to get them to say the entire Eucharistic prayer together. But we want to give the concelebrants more to say than just the words of institution. So what they did was they broke it up into segments and sort of the principal seg celebrant starts it, but then they alternate parts. And that's the basic reason. And which particular parts they say is a, is, is a matter of option. And it depends among other things, among how many communic how many concelebrants you have, because you want to spread the parts around so that everybody gets something to say more than just the words of institution. The next question comes from Brooke Kennel, who writes, so when I was little, I was terrified of chupacabras because I saw a news report that they were being blamed for the exsanguination of pigs on farms here in Texas. Now that I'm an adult, I've heard people say that it's all just mangy coyotes and other misidentified creatures. What does Jimmy think? Could such a creature really exist? Well, such a creature could exist. The difficulty is that if it does, why haven't we found it or its bones? And, why, and how does it maintain a stable breeding population while attacking livestock and simultaneously falling under our radar? 
because we've known about the standard livestock predators for ages, you know, wolves, coyotes, foxes, other things. And so where did this one suddenly come from and why is it not among the familiar ones? How is it maintaining a stable breeding population and staying below our radar and why haven't we found its remains? It's, it's possible there are many, many undiscovered species on Earth, but most of them are inaccessible to us in one way or another. They're hard to find because they either live deep in the ocean where humans can't go easily, or they're very, very small. And so they fall under our radar for that reason. If something's big enough to take down um, a goat by itself and not as a pack hunter, then it's big enough we probably would have found it unless it's in some really remote region where humans don't go. But if it's stacking livestock, it's not in a really remote region where humans don't go. So even though it's possible, and we will be talking about chupacabras in the future, I'm sure we'll have an episode of them uh, on them, my present best thought is that it probably is like coyotes with mange and wolves and dogs, you know, feral dogs and things like that. The two puncture marks that are often found in the necks of victims that of animals that are alleged victims of chupacabras is actually what you would expect in a canid attack because th that this is the way um, hunting works for canids. They've got the canine teeth that they use to puncture hopefully the neck of their prey when they're hunting, and so you would expect that kind of thing. And then sometimes they do or don't end up eating because let's suppose the uh, eating the carcass because let's suppose they're young or juveniles or if they're mangy, they're sick, and they may be so exhausted after the attack that they don't end up hanging around to eat the victim. And that could give that. Then the farmer comes out the next day and says, "Wow, my livestock has two neck holes and has not been eaten. It must have been exsanguinated by a by a chupacabra." Aaron Murphy asks, "I'd love to hear Jimmy and Dom discuss on the grounds of faith and reason the life of Saint Anthony by Saint Athanasius." So Athanasius wrote a biography of Saint Anthony of the Desert, uh, the founder of Egyptian monasticism, and it's an interesting read. We'll have a link to it so you can read it for yourself, and we'll think about, uh, I'll, I'll look at it to see what potential it might have for working as a show. I will warn folks, though, I'm not really into demons and talking about demons a lot, and so we will talk about them on future shows at some point. You know, we will have a show about demons and a show about exorcism, but it's not my favorite topic, so we're not going to we're not going to binge demons in the future, <laughs> so it'll it'll be finding the right balance. I, I am not sad about that. <laughs> Rosemary Sember writes, I'd like to know more about Reiki. It's known as a healing art or practice, I believe. Any validity to it? And what does the Catholic Church say about it? Thanks. So Reiki is an alternative health practice that comes from Japan. It's actually very recent. So even though it's from Japan, it does not have some long mystical tradition going back into the vanished ages of the past. Actually, the doctor who invented it died in 1926. So it's not very old. The basic idea is that human beings have a life energy in them known as ki, and that it can be manipulated to produce various health effects. Now, in terms of the church's position on it, actually, there is a very helpful statement from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Doctrine, because this became popular in some Catholic circles, so the bishops looked at it, and they came to the same conclusion I would. Their statement actually is very good, and we'll have a link to it. Basically, from a Christian perspective, nothing in the faith leads us to think that Reiki would work. The Christian faith doesn't hold that our bodies are suffused with this life energy that can be manipulated by human means. And so it doesn't, it doesn't have a basis in the Christian faith. Could it have a basis scientifically? Well, if we could find this energy and prove it exists and prove it can be manipulated, then sure. But we can't. The scientific studies that have been done do not support the existence of such an energy or its manipulation, and as a result, it doesn't have a scientific basis either, not a good one. I mean, people will always argue. 
And so as a result of not having a basis in faith and not having a basis in science, the church would regard this as a superstition. And so they discourage its use in Catholic settings. I would say that as, and so in a way, it's somewhat similar to other practices we've looked at like acupuncture. And I'm not saying there's no benefit to it because it can have a placebo benefit. Mm. You know, you, you go in, you go to the Reiki practitioner, they, they move their hands over your body, they tell you to relax and you're going to feel better. And yeah, there could be effects. So I'm not discounting the testimony of people who may say they've experienced benefit from it. They may well have experienced benefit from it. It just may have been the placebo effect that was responsible. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com. A-A-R-O-N-V.com. Making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. By Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. And by Single Player Mode, a personalized gaming experience. The newest book from Truist Dunkworth, intended for middle and high schoolers. It is a book as intriguing as it is mysterious. Now available on Amazon. Uh, next question comes from John Henry, who asks, what about yoga? I used to get really good health benefits from certain kinds of hatha yoga, and I thought of it the way one of my yoga instructors described it, as a Stone Age health practice passed down in a religious context, but basically just a set of movements, poses, and breathing techniques that are good for health. However, I've more recently heard and read things that indicate that yoga poses and breathing are sort of pagan prayers said in whole-body sign language to pagan gods. I wouldn't sing prayers to pagan gods under the excuse that they're just sounds and fun music, so I don't want to do the same with yoga poses, but I miss the health benefits. I used to experience using no equipment and in the privacy of my own home. Am I concerned without cause? Are there alternative forms of exercise I should be looking at instead? How should I think about yoga? Well, one thing we should do is avoid the genetic fallacy. The genetic fallacy occurs when you evaluate a thing based on its origin. And that's not a good idea because how the truth about something is often disconnected from its origin. A famous example that I use all the time is the word nice. In the case of words, meaning is determined by usage, not origin. So if I say that's a nice dress, it's a compliment. I'm not saying that's a foolish dress because that's where nice comes from. It comes from the Latin word nesius, which means ignorant or unknowing. Hmm. Well, okay, just because it originally meant ignorant or unknowing, it does not mean that today. It, today, it is a compliment. And so when you're looking at something that's a sign, like a word or a symbol, you have to say, what does it mean to me? What does it mean today? Not where did it come from? And so even if in the past there were yoga practitioners who interpreted their postures as some kind of physical prayer symbol to a Hindu deity, well, if that's not what it means to you, then it's not that. So it's like, how are you using a word? If you use nice to mean foolish, well, then that's what it means for you and your community of language users. If you use it to mean it as a positive thing, well, then that's what the word means to you and your community of language users. So if you don't interpret your own poses and breathing as pagan prayers, they're not. And so I wouldn't evaluate this in, in those terms for you. If you say you get benefit from doing this and you're not using it as a form of pagan devotional practice, well, then it's not a form of pagan devotional practice for you. And if you otherwise get benefit from it, you can use it as just exercise. I suppose the alternative, the, the flip side is people who listen to Gregorian chant because they, they think it sounds nice are not necessarily praying to God. They're just right, listening exactly. to nice music. They're not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Lenny Bear says, I, w I would like to hear something about the mysterious outback Australian Min Min Lights. They also reportedly occur in Saudi Arabia. Thanks. 
Yeah. So the Min Min lights, which are reported in Australia and a similar phenomenon in Saudi Arabia, are part of a broader category known as spook lights here or ghost lights. They're also sometimes called. And basically, they're mysterious lights that occur for unknown reasons at night. They're often seen in the distance. If you approach them, they often go out and there's a big question about what causes them. The most famous spook lights here in America, although there are many, the most famous ones are the Marfa lights in West Texas. And I actually have an uncle who's from Marfa and has seen the Marfa lights. Mm. And we will be talking about uh, both the Marfa lights and other spook lights in the future. The, in terms of speculation about what causes them, there are a number of proposals, which we'll be talking about car headlights is one that you often hear, that it's distant car headlights that are seen in unusual conditions that make them not look like car headlights. And that, I'm sure, is the explanation for some. But the problem is these spook lights have been reported a lot longer than we've had cars. And so that doesn't seem to be the full explanation of them. There may be other things, including some what are sometimes called earthquake lights that are you know, caused by r rock stresses underground and the piezoelectric effect. There can be lights caused by will-o'-the-wisp type phenomena from decaying organic matter and, and methane and things like that. There are even more exotic explanations, but we will talk about them in the future. I love the fact that the folklore always says, you know, if you chase it and catch it, you'll never return to tell the tale. And like, well, how do you know that? <laughs> it, well, if it's, if it, well, I mean, it, there may have been people who chased a piece of ball lightning and didn't come back. Well, I suppose. <laughs> but how do we know they caught it? That's the question. <laughs> All right. So uh, Amanda Fulfer asks, I'd like an episode explaining the Islamic religion and how it compares to Catholicism. I'll think about it. I do have some episodes on the list that involve Islam in one way or another. Like there actually is just like there are crazy people who say Jesus didn't exist. Well, there are also people who propose that Muhammad didn't exist. And I don't buy that at all. But we're likely to, I think, I think we have good evidence that both Jesus and Muhammad existed. And so, but because there's a controversy, we may have a did Muhammad exist episode in the future. The question would be how an episode about Islam would be framed more generally. Because, you know, the show is about examining mysteries, not just doing comparative religion. And so I need to think about that. But we will be talking about Islam in various respects in the future. I'm not sure about how um, a, a general hears what Islam is and says and how that contrasts with the Christian faith. I'm not sure if that's a mystery of the sort we handle on this show. But there are there are other good introductions to that subject, and it's something I could easily do in another format. It would just be a question of would that be appropriate for Mysterious World, or would it be more appropriate to, say, Catholic Answers Focus or something mm -hmm. like that? Okay. Uh, Gregory Fontana writes, I think I recall Jimmy mentioned in one episode the CIA utilizing the news media in its activities. What could he further explain about that? Well, it's not just the CIA, but yeah, government, um, military, and in intelligence authorities do use the U.S. Me the U.S. media. As we heard in episode 151 on Operation Northwoods, one of the plans was to blow up plastic explosives. To one of the proposals was to blow up plastic explosives to to injure Cuban refugees and get wide press coverage. To, as a pretext for starting a war in Cuba. So that obviously would be media manipulation, as would multiple other aspects of the plan of Operation Northwoods. Now, that was proposed by the Joint Chiefs of Staff rather than the CIA, but the CIA definitely has its fingers in the media and has since it was created. We will have in uh, in the resources for this show, a lot more information about that. Uh, articles on CIA influence on public opinion, Operation Mockingbird, which is the reported name of their media manipulation effort. A report from the Senate Intelligence Agency, or, uh, sorry, the Senate Intelligence Committee on the CIA use of journalists and clergy. Mm. 
as well as a 1977 New York Times article on the CIA's Worldwide Propaganda Network. All right. Uh, Patrick writes, what is Jimmy's take on the word addiction and how it's used in the psychological community, especially as it pertains to non-substance abusers? And as a follow-on, what does that mean for how society should treat addicts? And, and as background, he says, I recently listened to one episode, can't remember it right now, where Jimmy expressed an opinion about addictions or addicts that seemed to run contrary to both the research that I've read about addiction and the addicted people who I've worked with over the past decade or so. It was the first time I ever walked away bothered or in disbelief from something Jimmy said. So I'd like to get a more full picture of Jimmy's views. Well, I certainly don't mind people, you know, disagreeing with me. I never expect people to agree with me. In terms of addiction, my problem with the term there, I guess I have a couple of problems with the term. One of them is it's uniform. It, it expresses only one category, but it's applied to people who have very different situations. I mean, some people eat too much chocolate and they'll say, oh, I'm addicted to chocolate. And then you have other people who are on some kind of hardcore narcotic that if they stop it and go cold turkey, they will die. Well, that's a broad range of, of outcomes. And even if you dismiss the chocolate addiction as just something people say, there is a tendency to overclassify people who have much less severe forms of habituation and classify them as addicts. And so I think one problem with the term is that it's applied to an enormous range of conditions that makes it unuseful to a significant degree. I think actually now in the psychological community, there is a famous uh, manual. It's called the DSM, which stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And it's used to classify different uh, mental health conditions. And it goes through various editions. The DSM-4, which is not the current version, but it's the one that precedes it. The DSM-4 did not list addiction as a category. They broke it down into uh, at least a couple of subcategories, one of which was called substance abuse and the other of which was called substance dependence. And abusing a substance means you're using too much of it. Being dependent on it, though, means that if you stop using it, there are going to be varying negative consequences of varying levels. So I thought that was actually a step in the right direction, that we're starting to distinguish between these different things. We're not just using addiction as a blanket label for fundamentally different phenomena. If you drink too much coffee, that doesn't mean you're addicted in the same way that your heart will stop if you discontinue your hardcore narcotic. So I think that rather than having a single bucket that we put all of these phenomena in, it would be better to have several different terminologies to more accurately and precisely describe different conditions. The second problem I have with the way the term gets used, I have no problem with words in themselves. I mean, you know, words are nice. <laughs> yes. But I have no problem with the term itself. It's just the way it gets used. The second problem I have is after you throw everybody in one bucket and say this person is addicted, you then have the connotation in our culture today that that means they're not in control of their actions. And that is a disempowering message that can unintentionally uh, leave people in their condition when their life could improve if you gave them a more empowering message. Like, okay, so you're drinking too much coffee. You can get over this. You know, you can moderate it. That's within your power. Coffee does not have such power over you that no matter what the Folgers Coffee spokesman says, one drop does not mean that you are irrevocably wedded to guzzling down too much coffee. And similarly, there are a range of other things that can be done that are more empowering to help people actually improve their lives. The term addict, though, implies a lack of control, and it can also imply a much harder journey than is necessarily the case. Now, if you're in a condition where your heart will stop where you, when you, if you go cold turkey, there is a hard road ahead. That doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means there's a hard road ahead. But think about a person who is just habituated to too much coffee. 
okay, you know, there would be a little bit of difficulty in moderating that. But if you, if you're, if you scare the person into thinking they're an addict and they're powerless over their consumption of coffee, they may say, oh, wow, this road ahead is going to be so difficult. I don't even want to try. And so it can leave people in this condition where their life could improve. They don't have to be on edge all the time because they're drinking too much coffee. So, uh, or have a racing heartbeat because, you know, too much caffeine can, can cause palpitations. I would like to see the term clarified in a way that more accurately distinguishes between the range of phenomena that people lump under it and that also is disassociated from the message of disempowerment. I don't deny that there are phenomena you could accurately call addiction. It's just a question of which phenomena are they and how can we best help people who are in those conditions. Mm. Distinctions are always useful to, to make. St. Thomas Aquinas certainly thought so. <laughs> yes. Ken McCloskey writes, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. One quick follow-up question to the weight loss episode. The conclusion, as I understood it, was that insulin is the primary driver to how our bodies store fat and that by reducing the frequency and magnitude of insulin spikes, we could control how much fat our body carries. I did experiment with this approach and found it does work. However, I'm still stuck on the rule of conservation of energy, mea culpa, and would like to know, does it therefore follow that one could consume unlimited calories once a day and not gain weight? Think of a Joey Chestnut diet and just gorging on hot dogs once a day. 75 hot dogs, 150 calories each equals 11,250 calories, sons, buns. In other words, is the rule for conservation of energy completely inoperable when it comes to weight control? Do calories matter at all? If not, where do the excess calories go? So insulin is one of the primary drivers uh, as a hormone in weight management. It's not the only one. Cortisol is another one, but it plays a lesser role. Also, ghrelin and leptin influence whether we feel hungry or full. So it's more than just insulin that's involved here. But to go to the, the basic question that Ken poses about do calories matter? Yes, they do. Joey Chestnut, by the way, is a competitive eater for people who may not be familiar with him. If you consume enough calories in a single day, even if you're only eating them in one meal, you will gain weight or your weight will remain steady or you'll lose weight depending on the number of calories you're eating in your one meal a day. If you eat, if you try the Joey Chestnut thing where you eat 75 hot dogs at 150 calories each, so it's 1100 and 11,250 calories a day. Well, the first thing is you're not going to absorb all those calories because you're overtaxing how much your gut can absorb at once. You're going to be going to the bathroom. And a lot of those calories are just going to go right through you and will not be absorbed. So you won't really get 11,000 calories, but you might get 3,000, let's say. Well, if you eat 3,000 calories a day and your metabolism only burns 2,000 calories, let's say, and people's metabolisms actually vary widely in this, but let's say your metabolism is set to burn 2,000 and you eat 3,000. Well, if you've absorbed 3,000 calories and you've only burned 2,000, then 1,000 of those are going to get stored as fat. So you can gain weight on one meal a day. You also can maintain weight on one meal a day, or you can lose weight on one meal a day. And it, it's really up to the individual to figure out where those thresholds are for them. This reflects my own experience. I can, depending on how much I eat, if I'm eating one meal a day, I can gain weight, I can keep it the same, or I can lose it. And I have a sense of what I need to do in order to make that happen in terms of how much I eat. So I know, for example, if I have a can of soup and a bag of popcorn as my meal a given night, I'm going to lose some weight. But if I eat half of a pizza laden with cheese and meat, I'm definitely not going to lose weight. And if I do that multiple nights in a row, I might gain some. Half of a large pizza, by the way, not a <laughs> personal pan. Right. Chris Stratti, uh asks, it would be good to hear Jimmy's take on artificial intelligence. Should more be done to make sure we don't end up like the doomsday movies we see, or are we too dependent on the convenience? Sure seems like the AI is sure dividing us, especially politically. I think more work does need to be done on artificial intelligence, including its precursors, the algorithms and bots 
that are influencing social media now. The, the division that we have now is bad. And I think doomsday scenarios involving artificial intelligence also need to be taken very seriously. I, I, I think it is naive to be entirely dismissive of such things. Very serious people are of the opinion that if we get robust AI, it needs to be very, very carefully controlled, especially if you're doing things like giving it authority to make autonomous firing decisions. Yeah. Which yes. is a proposal that yes. is out there for get we need to let some of our AI systems have autonomous firing decisions in combat. And wow, that is scary. Because <laughs> yeah. as we all know, technology doesn't always do what you want it to. <laughs> right, right. Uh, by the way, I would suggest that we we often talk about artificial intelligence on in machine learning, which is another name for it, on this the StarQuest uh, podcast, Secrets of Technology. So, uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, do subscribe to that as well. Uh, G Ray writes, Jimmy, what should we make of dream interpretation? We see it in the Bible with Joseph and the Pharaoh, but I never hear anything today about this practice in the church. I myself have vivid dreams all the time, and even had dreams that later came to reality. Should we ever think of dreams of having spiritual significance? Side story, I once picked up a book on dream interpretation at a bookstore. The first page I turned to said that if you dream about watermelons, it means you're about to get money. I laughed and put the book down. <laughs> so actually, there. Now, first of all, we will be talking about dreams in the future, including precognitive ones and dream interpretation and all that stuff. Actually, there are segments of the Christian community that are into dream interpretation, because we do have dreams being interpreted in the Bible. And so some folks, especially in Protestant community and kind of in the, some in the evangelical and charismatic movements, are really into that. And they refer to this as doing dream work. And there are books about it. I'm not going to link any of those books, because even though I have some of them, I haven't read them yet. And I don't want to be recommending books that, you know, deal with religious matters that I haven't read and digested and am convinced are recommendable. But there are books out there on Christian books on dream work and dream interpretation. And so it is a thing that's out there. I have some caution around this because my suspicion is that just like a lot of kind of new age books on dream interpretation are really not great, I suspect that there's some misinterpretation and principles that would lead to misinterpretation in these Christian dream books. I think a lot of what happens in dreams is random stuff that our subconscious is generating and that is not conveying a meaningful message. What it's trying to do is help prepare us emotionally for various situations by putting us in these scenarios like, you know, job anxieties or family anxieties. I can't find my child. Where is my child? You know, that is happening in a dream to kind of process, you know, what it would be like in that experience and to maybe process things you're worrying about subconsciously so you can kind of set them to one side and get rid of them maybe. Or... It's also, and there are also other things that it's involved with, but I suspect of it, a lot of it does not actually have a, much of an interpretation. Now, I'm not dismissive of the idea that some dreams are. I myself have had, I have had precognitive dreams where it was just a videotape of what happened the next day, or mm. where it's partially what happened the next day, but not fully. It was kind of cloaked in another guise. And so I recognize, like Thomas Aquinas, that, um, that you know, there can, that can happen. Um, and God can also directly give you dreams about the future or dreams with some spiritual significance. But I think we need to be a lot more careful and a lot more critical in how to evaluate all that. And so we will be doing a future episode on it. All right. Jimmy Chappell writes, what are your thoughts on the concept of astral projection? Have there been any promising parapsychological studies done on the topic? Given the similarities to remote viewing, could these just be two explanations for the same phenomenon? 
So uh, astral projection is a concept that uh, does come from parapsychological circles. It's basically a, a voluntary out-of-body experience. An out-of-body experience occurs where a person's perspective shifts so that they are no longer seeing things from the perspective of their eyes. This is commonly associated with other phenomena like near-death experiences where a person's heart stops and suddenly their perspective shifts and they're looking down on their own bodies, on their own body, and the doctor's trying to resuscitate them. And they may then travel around. Their perspective may continue to shift and they may, you know, look at other things in the hospital or, you know, go through a tunnel of light or things like that. Out-of-body experiences can also occur or are reported in other situations where a person is not in danger of death. Their heart is not stopping, but for one reason or another, snap, a person involuntarily without meaning to has their perspective start shifting. And then if you train yourself to have out-of-body experiences, that's often called astral projection. So essentially, astral projection involves a voluntary shifting of perspective away from the body. And this is supposed to be a very full experience. You don't, it's not like you get little intuitions about what a distant place is like. It's like you, you feel like you're there. And uh, sometimes this is also called bilocation in the parapsychological community, which may or may not correspond to the different ways bilocation is understood in theology. And we'll have future stuff on all that. It, it is plausible to me that this is connected with remote viewing. Remote viewing is the reported parapsychological ability that has some statistical data behind it suggesting uh, that it's possible to remotely pick up sensory impressions of different areas. And astral projection could simply be an intense form of remote viewing. Remote viewers often will talk about something called the aperture, which is it's kind of like the aperture of a camera that can be opened narrowly or widely. And in a typical operational remote viewing experience, what they're trying to do is open the aperture enough to get sensory impressions of a distant location, but not so much that they become absorbed in that experience. Because if they're totally absorbed, they stop talking and writing and reporting what they're seeing. But sometimes it does happen anyway. A story is told by former U.S. psychic spy Paul Smith when he was in training. By Ingo Swan. He was up at Ingo's place in New York with his fellow trainees, and he went to a bookstore and he got a bunch of books. And this is like in November, and he's walking back in New York on the snowy, icy streets. And he mentally started thinking about a target that he had been assigned to view earlier that day, which was like an island somewhere, a very warm, lush, tropical type island. And all of a sudden, he started viewing it again, and the aperture went full wide open, and he's like feeling sand between his toes and is totally immersed in seeing this island while he's walking down the street in New York, and he doesn't realize he's walking down the street in New York, and he's like stumbling and about to fall over and things like that. And when he, when he got back, Ingo said, never do that. <laughs> um, so it could be, if remote viewing is a real phenomenon, that astral projection could be a kind of full open aperture form of remote viewing, and an out-of-body experience could be an involuntary, accidental triggering of a full open aperture viewing like Paul Smith had walking down the street in New York in the snow. Those are just possibilities. There are other aspects to these phenomena that you could use to push back against that, but that's what we'll be talking about in the future. All right. Michael Herman says, I'd like Jimmy's take on the origins of chiropractic, since the founder, D.D. Palmer, said he got it from the other world, from a deceased medical physician named Dr. James Atkinson. It appears to me that chiropractic was directly born out of the spiritualist movement, Palmer even thought of himself as a founder of a new religion. Given the church's stance on Reiki and yoga, I'm surprised that I've never heard anything about chiropractic, since in my area, at least, many of the chiropractors seem to lean more into the woo-woo, for lack of a better word, 
origins and completely reject modern medicine. I've tried to warn a few of my fellow Catholics that they should be careful about which chiropractors they go to, given its origins, but they'll have none of it and accuse me of making it all up, despite their constant lecturing to me that my geek hobbies are of the devil. Having said all that, I fully recognize that many chiropractors are legitimate medical professionals and provide real medical benefits. Should chiropractic receive the same level of scrutiny as yoga, Reiki, and acupuncture? So I think, once again, we have a single term, chiropractic, that's being stretched to cover multiple things that aren't all the same. There is a division in uh, the chiropractic community between practitioners who are called straight, meaning they honor the original kind of philosophy of D.D. Palmer and his son, and then there are mixed practitioners who have some of that, but also reject some of that. And there are practitioners who really aren't into the so-called woo-woo aspects of chiropractic. So I think all three of them, I, I, I think we need to apply scrutiny, but we need to recognize the differences. I think the interpretation that Palmer and his son put on the practice and some of the claims they made about it are quite problematic. On the other hand, as uh, Michael says, a lot of chiropractors, regardless of the interpretation they put on what they're doing, actually do provide medical benefit. I know that firsthand. I've, I've been to a number of chiropractors over the years, and it really will help in ways other things will not help. So we are going to have a future episode on this, and I'll talk you know, about my personal experiences as well as the background here. But just in kind of capsule form, back in the 90s, I had uh, severe back inflammation. And all, and I went to my, to my regular doctor, conventional medical practitioner. All he could do was provide anti-inflammatories, and they did not work. They were not solving the inflammation in my back. And he suggested, well, maybe go to a chiropractor. So I did. The chiropractor, you know, puts me down on the table, touches my back. Oh, we're quite inflamed here, aren't we? He did an adjustment, and I got relief that I was just not getting from traditional medicine. And so I think there is a useful, I think there is therapeutic benefit to many of the things that chiropractors are doing, or at least the basic ones like making adjustments and, and um, you know, realigning vertebrae and taking tension off of muscles and stuff. I think, I think that stuff actually can provide a very useful service and relief to people who are suffering, but it's surrounded and overlaid sometimes by ideas that are either not well scientifically supported or that are of dubious philosophical and spiritual origin. So I think, once again, we have to exercise critical thinking and sort the good from the bad. And certainly the things that you said already about Reiki and yoga apply in this case as well to, to apply those principles. Yeah. yeah, it's the same basic set of principles. Okay. Samuel Devick writes, Hi, Jimmy, I'm wondering about blessings. Who can give a blessing what kinds of blessings are there, and what does it mean to bless those who persecute you? So the so it's Romans fourteen Romans twelve fourteen where Paul says, uh, "Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse." And there are parallel statements in Matthew and Luke that are almost the same, but not quite. And in terms of blessings, now we did an episode a while back. It was episode one twenty six on curses. And curses are basically the flip side of blessings. Now, the term blessing, as we won't be surprised by this point in the episode, can have more than one meaning. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what's the relevant one for what St. Paul is talking about in Romans? And he could, just on a general level, mean say nice things about the the people who persecute you or take a charitable attitude towards them. But it's really more than that, I think. He's meaning blessing in the theological sense where what, so a curse is where you say something or do something in order to bring harm to an individual. And a blessing is the opposite of that. It's where you say something or do something in order to bring good to an individual. And in a Christian context, what blessing someone will mean is basically asking God to cause good things to happen to this person. 
So what Paul is saying is even when a person is persecuting you, don't just ask that God harm them. Ask that God help them. You know, like maybe that they would repent of the fact they're persecuting you. But this is part of the universal ethic of love that we're called to have as Christians. We want good things to happen to people. Now, that's not to say that sometimes they need to be harmed. Sometimes they need to be harmed as a way of waking them up to bring about the good. But our fundamental drive should not be to just lash out and attack people and wish bad things on them. We should wish good things on them and ask God to to help people. And that's basically what's meant here. Now, subsequently to St. Paul's time, the church, I mean, blessings predate this by a long ways. They're mentioned, for example, in the Old Testament, and they came in different kinds, and some blessings could be given by certain people, but not other people. For example, in the Old Testament, there is a famous blessing that is prescribed for the priests to use to bless the Israelites. And that distinction between blessings anybody can give, because anybody can ask God to do something nice for someone, and blessings that are reserved to clergy is a distinction that the church has continued to use. And so today, in its book of blessings, as you go through it, you find that some of these blessings are like reserved to a bishop, like blessing an altar in a church when you're dedicating a church. Some of them are reserved for priests and bishops. Some of them are reserved to deacons, priests, and bishops. Some of them a laity can perform. So you really have to look at the individual blessing in question, but fundamentally what they're all doing is asking God to do something good. That's what the blessing is. And we're likely to do a future episode on this as a companion piece to our episode on curses. All right. Uh, Samuel also says, uh, also, I know we may be limited to one question, uh, thus disproving this by reading this. I'm wondering what Bob Barley's religion was and if he was baptized a Catholic or other denomination before he died. So for much of his career, Bob Marley was a Rastafarian, which is a religion focused on Haile Selassie, the Ethiopian emperor, as God. But a lot of Rastafarians have rethought that. I mean, I'm, I know there are still Rastafarians out there, but a number have rethought it, including Bob Marley before he died. Uh, before he died, Bob Marley was, uh, was received into the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And so he died a Christian rather than a Rastafarian, and he was Ethiopian Orthodox. Excellent. And by the way, they have the biggest biblical canon of all Christian communities. Yes, uh, uh, they do. <laughs> Aileen Gale writes, uh, Hello, gentlemen. I would love to hear Jimmy's opinion on Jesus's years before he began his ministry. Jimmy mentioned on another show that he believed it to be plausible that Jesus took care of his mother because Joseph died shortly after the finding in the temple story. What evidence, myths, and other traditions are there? I heard that certain areas in the Holy Land believe Jesus spent time there as a younger man. What do you know? So I don't know when St. Joseph died. It was sometime between when Jesus was 12 and when he was 30. At least that's the evidence, what the evidence in the biblical text would suggest, because he is there at the finding of the temple when Jesus is 12, but he's nowhere to be found when Jesus begins his ministry around age 30. Somewhere between then is, I think, when Joseph died. And presumably, Jesus would have, at least until his itinerant ministry began at age 30, have been supporting his mother, along with the other so-called brethren of Jesus, who I think were most likely children of Joseph by a former marriage. I think that the evidence we have points to Jesus leading a fairly normal life in this period as a worker, as a carpenter. In fact, we have uh, second century statements that talk about how some of the implements like harnesses and chairs or something, I'd have to refresh my memory on exactly what the implements were, but that they were still in use in the second century, things that Jesus himself and Joseph had built. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, these people still had them and were still using them because they didn't have the concept of planned obsolescence back then. Well, they're probably perfectly made. <laughs> yeah, well, and and by the way, there's a, I'm thinking of doing a future episode on planned obsolescence and the light bulb conspiracy ah, that was yes. involved in starting the concept. Yep. Because you can have light bulbs that last 100 years and 
and there is one. There is one, yeah. That has been burning <laughs> for over 100 years, but that's not what the light bulb companies wanted. Yep. In any event, I think Jesus led a fairly normal life. There is, There are myths and traditions. Uh, one resource that you could check out for some of those is known as the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, and it recounts stories of Jesus as a child, among and some of which are rather colorful. And don't take them too seriously, though. This is basically Christian second century Christian fiction, where they're imagining what Jesus might have been like as a child. Because so, like one story, which actually I find really charming, is Jesus is fashioning little clay birds. Mm-hmm. You know, he's make got, got some clay and he's making these little birds. And Joseph points out, "Hey, you're doing that on the Sabbath. Shouldn't be doing that. It's the Sabbath." And so he like claps his hands and the birds fly away. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of a charming story. But then there's yeah. the other story where a, another kid is making fun of Jesus and gets struck dead. <laughs> so, you know, interesting to read, but this is basically this is basically mid second century Christian fiction. That's not to say it doesn't that the infancy gospel of Thomas or others like the infancy gospel of James, which is from a little earlier in the second century, I th- I think they can in some cases contain accurate traditions about Jesus and his family, but you got to be really careful with that. It needs to be supported. A given tradition needs to be supported by other evidence. Jordan S. writes, Hello, Jimmy and Dom. I'd like to see an episode on the Shimabara Rebellion in 1638, led by the 17-year-old Catholic Amakusa Shiro. I want to see your take on it. So it's an interesting story. Amakusa Shiro is kind of the Japanese Joan of Arc. So the Shimabara Rebellion happened when, in an area that had a high Christian population, the local lords were really heavily taxing the local people, among other things. And it was during time of famine, and they were like building Edo Castle and getting ready for I think, military expeditions elsewhere, and they were putting this really heavy burden on the population as well as oppressing the Christians among it. And finally, people had enough. And so uh, a rebellion started. A key figure in that was the teenage uh, Amakusa Shiro, who was regarded as having miraculous powers by some, kind of like, you know, Joan of Arc. And eventually he was betrayed and he ended up uh, being executed at uh, age 17, whereas Joan of Arc ended up going to like 19. Uh, and he's popularly regarded among Japanese Catholics as a folk saint, even though he hasn't been officially canonized. And so it's an interesting story. I've got some preliminary information about it, and we'll definitely consider it as a, for a future episode. Charlene writes, what would it be like to be born without original sin? Would we have the same emotions and feelings? Would sin just not be attractive to us or maybe even disgust us? Or, and do you think the Blessed Mother was aware that she was somehow different from others? I think that Mary was definitely aware of uh, the fact that she was different from others. Exactly how she would articulate that is something that we could only speculate on. If, if you asked her, are you born without original sin? She would say, what? Because original <laughs> sin was not a theological term in the first century. Mm. It's a term that came up later. But if you asked her about, you know, by God's grace, have you been specially protected from sin? She would say, oh, yeah, I definitely believe that. And in terms of what emotions she or other unfallen people would have, sin would... So so temptation is essentially disordered desire. It doesn't mean desire for something you can't have. When Jesus is in the desert, he has a physical hunger. He has a desire to eat, but he's determined that he cannot have anything to eat for these 40 days. So you can have desires for things that you can't have, and that's not sinful temptation. It becomes sinful when it's disproportionate, when you desire something more than you should or less than you should. And if you were unfallen, and had perfectly balanced desires, you wouldn't, you would desire some things less than you do, and sin would be less attractive, and it could even be disgusting to a greater degree than what we normally experience. Although sometimes even in a fallen state, it's like, wow, that is a gross sin. I wish I'd never done that. 
Mm. And also, simultaneously, we would be more attracted to other things that are actually good for us. And it's like, oh, that high roughage salad was so much more delicious than the cheeseburger would have been, you know. <laughs> I don't believe that. Uh, well, it, right. <laughs> and, and as there's nothing wrong with cheeseburgers and salads are not intrinsically superior. Yes. Both have a place in the human diet. It's just we wouldn't be inordinately attracted to right. one and inordinately dismissive of the other. Of course. Uh, and b being uh, without original sin doesn't mean you can't sin, of course, because we saw that with Adam and Eve. That right. They, that's, they a, that's a separate situation. But yes. linked. Thomas Jose Maria Kitching writes, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. My all-time favorite comic book series is Transmetropolitan. In that series, they have a lab where people who were cryogenically frozen hundreds of years ago are being brought back to life in an, in, in an irreverent, oh, well, I suppose we have to fulfill this ancient contract type of way. It's years since I last read it, but I remember the people coming back to life and just being let out the back door wearing a hospital gown into this dystopian future where very little was recognizable to them. Most of them went crazy within a few hours and couldn't cope with being alive again since everyone they ever knew was dead, they had no job, no purpose, and were brought back to life by someone on minimum wage, barely paying attention and using the leftover canisters as an ashtray. Anyway, if this really did happen in hundreds of years, what kind of life could these defrosted people expect? Well, it's hard to say. I suspect, as as interesting as Transmetropolitan sounds as a comic book, uh, I mean, I think it could be a very interesting story to read. So I'm not surprised you're uh, that you like it. I don't think that that would be the scenario that uh, returning corpsicles would likely find themselves in. The reason is, if technology has progressed to the point that we can really bring people back from being cryonically frozen, and yes, we have a future episode that I've already done research on for cryonics. And it can be a little icky, but if if we had a society in the future that was advanced enough to uh, really bring people back and that was interested in doing so, then I think it would be a post-scarcity society in all likelihood, and that they would not be brought back and just kind of dumped out on the street. I think there would be a reorientation program and that the future prosperous society that has the resources to care about corpsicles and bring them back would care about them enough to use its abundant resources to help them get back on their feet. Kind of like in that next gen episode where right. they unfreeze some people and suddenly we're in this post scarcity society and we need some reorientation. And I think that's what would happen too if they unfroze you and brought you back. I think there would be definite surprises because history is always surprising. It's kind of like at the beginning of the Woody Allen movie Sleeper. Uh, Woody <laughs> Allen has been frozen and back in the 20th century and now it's the future. They're going to revive him and they're talking about him before they bring him back or as they're bringing him back. And it's like, OK, so he was a vegetarian. He didn't eat meat. And instead he ate something called wheat germ. How could people put that in their bodies? You know, it's like <laughs> health advice. It's like everybody in the future is on a low carb diet. You know, that's right. the healthy thing they've realized. And as soon as they get him back, they it's like, okay, take the cigar and try to get the smoke deep into your lungs. You know, and, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so there definitely would be surprises, but I suspect there would be a reorientation program. Yeah, just like if someone from a hundred years ago. Uh, we're suddenly brought to the today the difference in the things we tell them that they should and shouldn't do. Yeah, that would be yeah. shocking. Bill and Joanna Martell right? Uh, is introversion and extroversion real or just convenient social constructs? Do we have biblical examples of each? And do they teach us anything about how to interact with each type? And if there is alien life, do you think they will possess such proclivities? So introversion and extroversion are real phenomena. They're real personality characteristics. That doesn't mean that they explain everything. There's kind of a spectrum between them, and they can happen. You can be introverted in one circumstance and extroverted in another. Now, th and this I will apply my, this to myself here. So 2020, the year of the COVID pandemic, everybody is social distancing and under lockdowns and things like that. And I actually went seven months without being in a room with another human being. And I was fine. 
this is one of those situations where being an introvert pays off big time. You know, you're <laughs> yeah. under COVID lockdowns. On the other, now that didn't mean I didn't have contact because there's Skype and and Facebook and Zoom and and the the telephone and things like that. So I had plenty of contact, but I didn't feel the need to just be in other people's presence or I would be desperate. But other people are not like that. Other people would go crazy if they didn't have more human contact. But so that's kind of me as fundamentally I'm or primarily I'm an introvert, but I'm not always. I can I I refer to it as turning it on and become an extrovert. If I'm giving a talk or if I'm calling a dance, I can turn it on and for a limited time be an extrovert. But eventually I need to default back into my normal state. The the worst thing for me is having to be at parties where I don't know people. That is just incredibly draining for me. Mm. I can't wait to get out of that situation. I, I love talking to people I know. I love talking to a single person or a small group. But if I'm expected to mingle and have short conversations with lots of people I don't know, that is just really hard for me. I was talking to my sister about this, and she's like I am. Uh, it, but her husband, my brother-in-law, is not. So sometimes he and she would be at parties and my sister is just cringing at having to do the superficial social interaction. But Rusty is a social butterfly that <laughs> thrives off of it. And my sister actually, when, uh, when she had, a, had her baby, it's like, oh, suddenly I have this toddler who gives me the perfect excuse at parties. Excuse me, I need to care for my toddler now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, those are real things. In terms of biblical examples, well, I think all of the 12 apostles, because they were apostles, would have been on the extroverted end, but not as much. Peter and Paul had unusual force of personality that allowed Peter to be the leader of all the apostles and allowed Paul to become a major figure, even though he wasn't one of the 12. So I think both of them were definitely on the extrovert end of the spectrum. Others, like James, son of Alphaeus, who's one of the last listed in the list of 12 apostles, I think he was probably extroverted in many situations, but not as much as Peter and Paul. Same thing with Judas, not Iscariot, you know, the other Judas. He's probably extroverted in, most, in many situations, but not as much as Peter and Paul, or he would be mentioned more prominently. If you look at the Old Testament, we definitely have differences between introverts and extroverts. The classic example that I can think of is Jacob and Esau. Esau in Genesis is presented as, you know, this wild man, this outdoorsman, this country man who really likes being outdoors and going around and doing macho manly stuff. Whereas Jacob is described as being a quiet man who lived among the tents. And so I think Esau is definitely more introverted, Jacob, or extroverted. Jacob is definitely more introverted than Esau, at least in terms of their native personality bents. And I also think this applies to other species. If you just look at the dog world, my sister had a dog. It was seven-eighth Siberian Husky, one-eighth wolf. Her name was Locke. And wow, she was intensely extroverted, <laughs> which is what you want in a pack animal like a Siberian Husky who's mm. bred to pull sleds. You want them excited and physical and friendly and eager to work with other people and dogs. And you want an extrovert in that position. And boy, did that breeding show in Locke's case. She would explode with joy anytime anyone came over to the house and immediately have to hop up on, I mean, prop herself up on them with her giant Siberian Husky frame and start licking them in the mouth. I mean, <laughs> that was just, you came over to the house, that was going to happen. And that's very different than what you see with, say, a Basset Hound. Now, a Basset Hound is like, you, you see the Hush Puppy dogs for the Hush mm -hmm. Puppy shoes. Those are Basset Hounds. Also on the Columbo series, Columbo's dog, Dog, is a Basset Hound. And they are very, they're bred to be very low-key and relaxed and not make a fuss. And, and they're not going to act like a Siberian Husky around you. <laughs> so um, Siberian Huskies are much more extroverts, 
on average, basset hounds are much more introverts. And so if this happens in the human species and in other species here on Earth, and you do see this variation in other species, I'm sure the same thing will happen if we discover intelligent aliens. Some species may be more extroverted than we are. Some species may be more introverted than we are. But within each species, unless they have a really controlling hive mind, the, you, there will still be individual variation within the species where some members are more extroverted and some members are more introverted. All right. Awesome. Well, that's all of the questions we have for now. Uh, I do want to thank all of our patrons and especially those who submitted questions. You can submit feedback on what we've talked about today by going to patreon.com slash starquest or by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page and leaving feedback there or send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or finally send a tweet to at mys underscore world. You'll find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at patreon.com slash starquest and eventually at sqpn.com slash mysterious when we release the episode to all listeners. We hope you've enjoyed this Patrons Questions show. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is only possible because of the generosity of our patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to support Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and have your questions answered on future shows for patrons, go to sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Akin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. Once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to and supporting Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>